Welcome everyone. It's just gone uh, 11 o'clock here in the UK. Uh, so we're gonna make a start while a few more um, participants uh, join us. So welcome to today's special event, Productive Uses of Energy, What Does It Take to Stimulate Demand? This is both a side event for the United Nations High Level Dialogue on Energy and part of the IIED debates series. We are delighted to have you with us. Um, I hope many of you have had an opportunity to engage in the other activities happening this week as part of the ministerial level thematic forums. A huge thanks to our co-host today. We've joined forces with some fantastic organizations who we will be hearing from shortly, including CLASP, the Ministry of Water Irrigation and Energy for Ethiopia, to Lima Solar, United Purpose, and Ethiopian Women in Energy. My name is Juliette, I'm the Events Officer at IIED, and I will be providing some technical support in this event today. With that, I am really delighted to hand over to our co-chairs for today, McKenna Ireri, who is the Manager for East Africa at CLASP, and Kevin Johnston, who is a researcher here at IIED. Over to you both. Thanks very much, Juliette. Very happy to be hosting a side event for the High Level Dialogue on Energy Ministerial Thematic Forums. The High Level Dialogue on Energy is the first global gathering on energy under the UN General Assembly since the UN Conference on New and Renewable Sources of Energy in 1981, so we're quite excited to see what comes out. I'd like to first set the stage for our audience so our great lineup of panelists can get straight into sharing their own experiences. I'll start by highlighting the energy access need, which for clean cooking solutions is around 2.6 billion people. But today we're focusing on electricity and productive uses, and globally the electricity gap stands at about 759 million people. We'll be looking at productive uses of energy experiences from Ethiopia, Malawi, and Uganda, and overall Sub-Saharan Africa remains the world region with the largest access gap, accounting for about 75% of the global deficit and 570 million people. Energy is not an end goal, it's rather an enabler of other development sectors. It's difficult to achieve any sustainable development goals without achieving SDG 7, universal energy access. Energy enables tools and opportunities for teachers and school management for better educational outcomes. It supports clinics and hospitals with life-saving machinery and equipment, especially important during these times. It provides sustainable irrigation solutions, as we'll hear more about today, for smallholder farmers, and enables small businesses to offer better services and capture more value within communities. And there are countless other examples across sectors. Some good news is that between 2017 and 19, progress in energy access outstripped population growth, resulting in a drop in the total numbers of unelectrified people. But this progress is threatened by negative impacts of COVID-19. Some additional bad news is that investments into the energy sector continue to fall short of what is needed to achieve SDG 7 by 2030, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. To make energy access investments financially viable, and more importantly, to enable more opportunities for remote and poor households, productive uses of energy is critical to enabling uh, energy access. So what is productive uses of energy, or PUE as we call it in the industry? Evidence from IID's research and many others in the sector, such as CLASP, shows that investing in installing energy infrastructure does not necessarily generate demand from communities organically. Additional efforts are needed to establish initial demand, and this is where productive uses of energy, or PUE, comes into play. PUE can be defined as using energy to increase income or productivity. And this could simply be a light bulb that allows a business to open longer hours in a small village, a more efficient and accessible institutional stove, or it could be powering large equipment and machinery in a remote location. PUE is also relevant for grid extension areas in some contexts where communities face similar challenges in energy access as off-grid areas. In recent years, there's been gr greater focus on activities that promote productive uses of energy. So what does it take to stimulate demand? Well, today I've baked a small PUE pie in an electric oven for today's event to highlight to our audience some of the crucial supporting services needed to enable PUE. And here you can see each piece representing just some of these supporting services that are needed to be in place to ensure that demand can be generated through productive uses of energy to enable livelihoods and local community economies. 
There are many other supporting services or pieces of the PUE pie that can, uh, you can read more about at the IED website and also CLASP's website. We'll be looking at three different perspectives of, en of energy access and PUE and the critical cross-cutting theme of gender. So we'll start with uh, the government. According to analysis from SMAP, policy frameworks to support mini-grid and off-grid systems developed more rapidly after 2010 than did those for on-grid electrification. So that's some good news, but much more needs to be done to support an enabling environment specifically for PUE. And we'll get more uh, information on this from the government of Ethiopia today and their efforts in supporting PUE. Energy systems that can electrify entire communities, so-called mini-grids, are expected to be crucial in reaching universal energy access and, importantly, in enabling remote and poor community economies. And today we'll hear about smaller generation solar mini-grids in Malawi and what PUE challenges United Purpose has faced and how they've overcome them. Moving down a level, uh, most sub-Saharan economies rely sig significantly on agriculture. There are millions of smallholder farmers that could be supported with solar irrigation solutions. We'll hear more on the experience of Tul Tulima Solar in Uganda and their efforts in reaching more smallholder farmers. And finally, we'll, reach, uh, we'll touch on the, the crucial cross-cutting theme of gender. So energy access doesn't necessarily bring equal benefits for everyone, especially between men and women. Women often face additional challenges and barriers to benefit from energy access. We'll hear more on, on some of these today from Ethiopian women in energy. And now I'd like to hand off to my co-chair -ho co host, uh, McKenna, to start the, the panel. Thank you so much, Kevin, and thank you so much for giving us a kind of big picture view of PUE and energy access. So I don't want to take up too much time. Let's just jump straight to, to it. We're so excited to have Yodid representing the Ethiopian government um, from the Ministry of Water, Irrigation and Energy on the panel today. Um, Yodid, um, Ethiopia seems to recently have really embraced productive use of energy. Um, could you please share with us how the Ethiopian government is, um, what the activities you're doing to kind of support productive use of energy? Uh, thank you. Yeah, so uh, we recently act, uh, has accepted this uh, productive use energy uh, based on our new 10 year uh, strategy document that we are following. And this national electrification effort that we have been use, uh, doing for the past few years has uh, helped us to recognize that uh, productive use of energy needs to be interlinked with uh, households, especially rural households where uh, we don't have grid uh, electricity or grid connection. So. Uh, in doing that, we actually have commissioned uh, six uh, agricultural production and processing uh, uh, study. It, it mainly focuses in horticultural irrigation, grain mining, injera baking, milk cooling, and uh, bread baking, so that uh, you know we would integrate the, the agriculture and the electrification project. So this has helped us to uh, assess the benefit both in cost wise, uh, whether the grid and the utility from our electricity generation, we could uh, recover cost and also how the community will be able to sustain their own uh, self. So that's been the main objective of the government using uh, this productive use energy. So it's so great to hear that you're thinking about it all the way from the national electricity planning, you're commissioning studies to gather data because we know data is so hard to come by in this sector and especially for productive use, uh, and that you're using that data to inform decisions. So it sounds like all ticking all the right boxes, but what advice would you give to other governments in terms of, for example, collaborating between different government streams? Because sometimes we, are, we recognize even with doing everything perfectly, sometimes there are silos that exist that don't allow us to work together effectively to deliver productive use. So would you have any advice for, for other governments looking to, to integrate productive use? Uh, yeah, so one of the main, uh issues that uh, we faced is financing when we start to do with this productive use energy. So uh, what, what we use is we followed, you know, those areas that are not grid connected, which means it requires quite a lot of investment in uh, off-grid uh, solutions, which means uh, pro either importing or producing, you know, solar panels. And also uh, we need to tell like, uh, 
train and educate the community that having light or having energy would uh, actually uh, help their livelihood. So if they are a uh, farming household, then they usually don't see the benefit of having electricity right on point. They will just automatically say that, well, I only have one light bulb to light, so why am I investing in electricity? But you know, through training, through uh, mobilizing a lot of uh, resources, we were able to convince community that having you know a communal uh, off-grid uh, energy solution will actually benefit them. So that's why we had to uh, attach our electrification scheme, uh, uh, our electrification scheme with agriculture. Uh, so that, you know, like uh, those, if we provide milk cooling opportunities, then the community will see the benefit of collecting milk uh, as a communal, and then they will be able to sell it, you know, not only around their area, but uh, to, to different uh, towns nearby. So that helped them to generate more income. So that's how uh, it started for the community to accept that having off-grid solution like solar path panel as a productive uh, energy use was uh, slowly and slowly being accepted by the country. So for other governments, what I would uh, suggest is that they need to invest, you know, more time, more infrastructural condition, and, you know, they also have to follow what the local community needs so that the, the acceptance will be high. Thank you so much, Yodit. Um, I love the way you've talked about how you focused on the off-grid spaces and you've started with um, understanding the needs of the community, right? And then um, integrating planning based on those needs. Um, so I, I want to maybe now focus on a, a different area. Um, we're hearing that off-grid communities, that that's, that's going to be one of the places that productive use can have the most impact, but also maybe some of the challenges. So um, moving over now to Malawi, we know that Malawi has one of the lowest rates of electrification, but there's been a lot of effort recently to ramp up decentralized energy, such as mini grids, especially for rural communities. Um, and recently, United for Purpose has been supporting rural electrification efforts as well. Um, so coming to you, Elizabeth, what opportunities do you see for mini grids, especially in your context in Malawi? Thank you so much, Makina, for having me on the panel. Well, there's a lot of opportunity for mini grid uh, development in Malawi. First of all, um, Malawi has a very low national electrification rate estimated at 12% and only 3% for the rural population. And expansion of the national grid uh, to the rural areas is slow due to the limited uh, government budgets on utilities. That's why the current Malawi national energy policy is promoting mini grids as one way of accelerating um, electrification in locations where grid extension cannot be an economically viable uh, electrification approach. The advantage that we have as a nation is that we have a lot of renewable energy resources like solar and perennial rivers, which can be used for electricity generation. And uh, most of the rural villages, um, they have a cluster set up. So this type of setup makes uh, power distribution easy and cost effective. We have also seen that demand for clean and reliable energy services from people in the rural areas is very high. And that the majority of rural communities are engaged in agricultural income generation. So there is a big opportunity for many grids offering productive use of energy in the agricultural uh, value chain. Well, that's great to hear that you're seeing that demand um, and you're trying to meet it with, with um, renewable energies, especially in the form of mini grids, even though there are some challenges, of course, with financing. Um, and, and as you're trying to deliver PUE attached to mini grids, what are some of the lessons you're learning as you're engaging with the community? Well, through our experience in developing a small solar mini grid in Malawi, we have learned that small scale village businesses are not very reliable and stable in terms of energy consumption and income generation. So without linkage to, to large productive use, uh, to large uh, productive energy users, the mini grid is likely to struggle 
to reach the critical uh, revenue needed for financial sustainability. And in addition to that, we have seen that it is important to engage the community on productive use of energy before developing the mini grid so that we can uh, actually deliver an impactful solution to the community. The people in the community have very brilliant ideas on productive use of energy, but it is not enough just to provide electricity and expect that community incomes will automatically increase. The communities need support to set up the businesses. They need financial support to buy appliances um, or machinery for production and processing. They need uh, technical capacity building, uh, and they also need support with finding markets for their final products. But for all of this to be successful, a sustained collaboration between stakeholders is required. The main challenge that we have um, faced as a mini grid developer is that the ability and willingness to pay is lower than anticipated. And this has been a challenge in terms of making decisions in tariff um, adjustments to balance a cost reflective tariff uh, in order to support operations and maintenance. That's why we are looking into adding some large productive users to increase daytime demand um, and in such a way increase income and allow for lower tariffs. This is so great. You're already touching on the pieces of the pie that Kevin was talking about, you know, the consumer financing, the technical um, assessment or technical um, sort of assistance that, that consumers need. The linkages to market, again, very, very crucial um, pieces of the pie that you're speaking of. And it's so great to hear how you are trying to kind of augment um, demand by attracting larger and larger kind of users of productive energy. Um, so that's super, super interesting. Kevin, now as we're talking about the pie, I'm going to hand it over to you to kind of dig a little bit deeper into some of the examples um, from Uganda and then also into the gender aspect. Thanks very much, Bagana. Um, so I'd like to move to Uganda now. Um, we know that agriculture is a significant portion of Uganda's economy. Um, so we're quite excited to have Tulima Solar um, offering solar water pumps to support horticulture and livestock activities here today. Um, Vincent, what are some of the general challenges that you've seen in reaching some customers with solar water pumps in Uganda? Uh, thank you for having me, uh, Kevin, and the team. Um, so the biggest challenges that we're experiencing or that we're experiencing in our market in Uganda is that uh, smallholder farmers are sparsely uh, sort of located or populated in different districts across Uganda. So the distances uh, become a challenge, especially for us, you know, service providers that are providing them solar water pumps. Uh, but luckily for us, uh, we entered the market in 2019, uh, backed up by Simu Solar that was established uh, in Tanzania in 2014. Um, so when we came into the market, uh, we felt that the way we could address the challenge of the distances is to partner up with organizations uh, that have an aggregation of farmers. Um, so in the market, we have about uh, 27 uh, lead generation partners. Uh, and these lead generation partners are, are organizations that, have, that are cooperatives, uh, some are circles, and then others are basically um, uh, what, what we call uh, you know, aggregators uh, sort of that buy, produce, and sell it abroad. Um, so we, this has greatly, greatly, greatly helped us in lowering our customer acquisition costs. Um, and then what we do, like on a monthly basis, we hold trainings and we hold demo days uh, for solar water pumps amongst their farm members, their farmer members. So in terms of in terms of, in terms of membership, they have about some range between 500 all the way to 500,000 farmers uh, per per lead generation partner. So that's a very good you know catchment area for us as a private company. Um, so when we hold these trainings, we normally get leads or people that are interested in solar water pumps. Um, and those people that are interested, we go out. Um, so we have sales officers that are located in many of the districts in Uganda. Uh, so we go out, we do an on-site evaluation uh, for the need of the farmer. So we look at uh, you know, the farmer's water needs, look at the water sources, we look at the distances um, that the farmer has to pump the water to where that's actually needed. Then we have a very robust tool, a design tool, 
that selects out um, a different pump or a customized pump for that particular farmer. And this is very, very important uh, because um, getting, getting an asset that's customized to them enables them to be more productive than actually getting a, a ready-made solution that's off the shelf. So that's a very, very key component on our business model. Um, so once we feed in that information in our design tools, uh, we, we usually come up with about two, um, uh, basically two options, either the farmer pays cash or we choose to finance them. And for the, for the financing option, we do underwriting uh, where we do an evaluation of their cash flows. Um, and preferably we finance people that, or we finance farmers that have been in the business for about two to three years and have proven cash flows that can be backed up by the lead generation partners that we basically have in the market. Um, so once that decision is made uh, between cash and financing, we deploy our engineering teams to do an on-site installation where we educate the farmer on how the pump works um, so that the, the concentration is removed from irrigation and it's really focused on, on being productive in the farm and making as much income as possible so that they can actually grow. Uh, one other aspect that we, one other sort of component that we do offer in the market that's not really available is we offer a two-year warranty or a two-year service warranty where the, if there's anything that's wrong with the system, in case a farmer wants servicing, repair costs, we deploy our teams within 24 hours to make sure that that's resolved. Thanks, Vincent. That's really interesting. So it sounds sure. like you guys are using existing structures to, to reach more people, um, more farmers in this case, um, which is quite, I think, uh, a unique solution. Um, you also touched on some other important issues in terms of the, the crucial aspect of customizing the pump for the solution for each farmer, uh, the, the after-sales service issues around the, the warranties that you offer, offer and, and so forth. Um, thanks so much. Um, looking at the time, I think we've got a lot of interesting questions to get to, so I'm going to have to move uh, on to uh, Lina uh, in Ethiopia. Um, like most places, uh, and greater energy access in Ethiopia is um, a challenge, can be a challenge um, when talking about gender equality access. So, uh, Lina, I'm, I'm interested to hear what are some of the challenges related to gender and productive uses in um, Ethiopia? What, what have you seen? Uh, thank you, Kevin. So, um when we look at the, uh, gender and electricity and productive use of energy, the main the issue we're looking at is on starting from project design. We, uh, we need to look at, we need to, uh, most projects are not asking the question on how can we affect a woman's life? How can we impact women's life? Uh, most of the projects, most of the reports and literatures talk about the, in the goal of the energy access, which is changing women's life, health care, education. But then uh, we're not looking at a deliberate uh, interventions which will affect women's life. So when we look at the woman in the, uh, in the picture, in the slide, uh, we're not, uh, we can see that a woman uh, trying to provide for energy, but we're not uh, looking at how we can change their life. So the main things we need to look at is first, um, providing uh, project designs. Project designs should be culturally sensitive. For example, when we look at a uh, woman's, uh, the men do dominated households, men headed households, if we're providing finance just for productive use of energy, we need to keep in mind that prioritization would be uh, made by the decision maker. So instead of buying a refrigerator, a decision could be made to buy a TV. Uh, again, uh, when we look at the access to finance, so the most important issue is access to finance. So uh, looking at energy access uh, and dif uh, different bit comparing between female uh, headed households and male headed households, we have seen an evidence that most male headed households are more able and willing to invest on electrification and thus uh, increasing their income, uh, the household income. Uh, and finally, when we look at uh, the other, how do you implement finance? So uh, providing access to finance is not enough by itself. We need to design commercially viable businesses 
to women. So when we design uh, businesses, we need to start moving away from the traditional gender roles. So we need to make sure that we need to keep in mind that there are women even in the most remote uh, rural areas who are entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurs. So we need to try to reach this woman through different training programs uh, and so on. Thanks so much, Linda. Um, can you give us um, some specific examples of what um, that might look like um, beyond the project design? Ha have you seen any success stories um, that you could tell us about? Um, okay, uh, so maybe not a direct example, but for example, looking at energy access and how women and male are being able to finance uh, energy access. So a very good example I was able to find was from the World Bank uh, reports, where they looked at um, World Bank energy access diagnostic reports for Ethiopia, when they compared between male dominated households and women dominated households. So in unconnected areas, uh, they gave them, a, there was an option uh, to pay upfront for electrification. And it was seen that uh, twice the percentage of male headed households were willing and able to pay, pay compared to women household, headed households, which only around 37% of such households were able to pay, but then when they give them an option of a 12 months payment option, then the percentage of women headed households increased substantially and it gets up to the point of 80, 85, around 85 percentage. So this shows us that if we provide a, a, a targeted financing and training to women, uh, we can increase actually willingness and ability to pay. That's great. Thanks so much, Lina. Um, I th think I hand over to McKenna now and we can start looking at some of these great questions that we're receiving um, from the audience. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, so many amazing questions and please keep them coming. So I guess we'll start first with um, gov our government representative and surprisingly some good questions there. Um, you did, is PAE subsidized by the Ethiopian government? And actually we'll hand over again to Elizabeth afterwards to respond to the same for Malawi. And if it is, can you give us some examples? Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, uh, most of our electrification projects are uh, fi financed and subsidized by the government. And uh, since the productive uh, energy use is a new, a new concept for us, uh, most of the studies we are doing and also the pilot project that we are doing are subsidized by the government. Uh, we're working along with some international uh, companies as well as funders, donor funders, uh, to, uh, to establish some uh, communal uh, mini-grid and off-grid uh, solutions. So in most cases and almost in all cases, it's being subsidized. So I'm guessing those are grants for the pilots uh, and not specific grants for the actual uh, products, right? No, for 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 uh, both the pilot and as well as for the project. So the community will uh, so will contribute through uh, their own labor and also uh, by providing you know some. Uh, some areas where the project will be commissioned, but in providing the, the solar panels or in, uh, in building the infrastructure, it will be both the government with the donor funders or the international community. A really interesting model there. Um, Elizabeth, to you, what is happening in Malawi? Do we have the subsidies? Uh, and as you're answering that, maybe you could pick up this other question about how you choose to locate your mini grid. Thank you so much, Makina. Um, United Purpose is a non-governmental um, organization and it implements projects using uh, donor funding. So for this particular mini grid project, we are implementing it with funding from the Scottish government um, and we're implementing it in collaboration with um, University of Strathclyde. So in the case of United Purpose is basically fun, uh, using donor funding so the subsidies for Malawi uh, for mini grid development are theoretically uh, there on paper, but then its implementation is yet uh, to begin. 
And moving on to the question about um, how we choose the areas to invest the mini grids. Uh, we do conduct uh, site assessments for all the sites that have been earmarked for mini grid development. So we work hand in hand with the, the, the Department of Energy uh, through the, um, the Malawi Rural Electrification um, section. So they already have um, a number of sites that have been earmarked for, for, for such type of developments. So we do conduct site assessments using a number of parameters like uh, distance from, from the national grid, um, number of households, uh, ability and willingness to, willingness to pay and more other parameters that we look at before we do the final selection. Thanks, Elizabeth. I'm sorry, I had a glitch there with my internet. Uh, so <laughs> so I, I thank you for answering that question. And I hope you also, I don't know if you answered the one on the large productive loads and, and some of the examples of that. If you did, we can move on. Okay, uh, so, so far, we only have small businesses that have been connected to the mini grid. As I said, people have uh, brilliant ideas, but then they don't have the finance that they can use to actually buy machinery or appliances for, for such type of businesses. And unfortunately, our um, funding does not provide um, financing for, for, for productive use of energy. So we are trying to look for parallel funding to actually support that um, component. So just to give an example, uh, in the community that we are working in, it's uh, a community where there's a lot of rice cultivation and they don't have a rice milling facility in the community. They actually travel uh, for a distance of about 10 kilometers to access the nearest um, rice milling facility. So uh, the community has been asking us if it is possible to power a, a rice milling in the community because they feel it will help them a lot. But as I said, they, there's no one in the community who can come in front to say, I am going to take up this business. I'm going to buy a solar milling machine and uh, install it in the community. So we, we are trying to look at ways of how we can, um, you, we can get parallel funding and, and develop some business models that can be able to actually implement such type of uh, productive use. Thank you. Over to you, Kevin. What questions are, are kind of rising to the top for you? Thanks, McKenna. Um, so here we have another one. Uh, with regards to women empowerment in a male-dominated society, most African cases, don't you think mindset change is a project that should be looked at in its on its own since it involves cultural change? Include funds for training, capacity building, and invest in the mindset change for a significant period of time. Um, I think this is a really interesting question, so I'd, I'd like to kind of leave it open. I could default to Lilna, but um, if anyone else has any thoughts, it would be great to hear a bit more on, okay. on, on that. Hello. Oh, thanks, Vincent. I just asked a question, so we'll, we'll get to you after this one. Um, so any thoughts on gender equality and, and kind of it being an entire um, gender transformation, so to speak, an entire project on its own? Um, any thoughts on, on that and, and energy access? Okay, uh, so yes, energy uh, gender equality is an issue on its own, but we cannot separate it from the other aspects. Energy, it could should be looked at side by side to energy. And that's why we were saying that we need, we, we need a targeted and deliberate interventions. So we need to look at how energy is affecting women specifically instead of looking at the society in general and we need to design projects specific to women so that they look at the cultural sensitivities the cultural uh, difference in designing projects yeah i think that makes sense so it's kind of um gender is indeed um very important and is a project on its own to transform really societies but also as you say Lilna it's it's important to keep that gender lens within the energy access and perhaps that can contribute um, to this um, gender equality issue um, thanks very much um, um, so I think um, this next question that I'm seeing source of financing for initial investments I believe that was answered that Scottish government um, grant funding 
Um, so that one is um, answered. Um, so here's an interesting one. Um, do you think it is worthwhile to provide grant subsidies to establish enterprises and or productive uses of energy in remote settings? Um, so this issue around subsidizing PUE itself. Oh, Vincent, you're back. I, I want to get you in while we while we have you. So let me hold that question. Um, Vincent, Hello. can you tell us a bit about uh, financing the solar water pumps and how quickly can a farmer cover uh, their investments through your PAYGO financing? Happy to answer that question. So once we have selected out a system for a farmer and the farmer has been approved for financing of credit. Um, so we normally, we, what we usually do is we have them pay 25% of the cash value of the system. We pay, they pay 25% down and then they pay installments with a little bit of interest rate for, for about 22 months. Um, we also have incentives where they can pay uh, three months, that whole balance within three months, and then they get the deposit back, the initial deposit back. And then if they pay that full, um, full financed amount within six months, uh, they can pay half the, they can actually get half the deposit back. Um, so basically that's, those are the three plans that we have for our farmers here. Great, thanks Vincent. And Vincent, do you collaborate with the local authorities in the course of providing irrigation pumps? What is the impact of the intervention to the rural livelihoods? Um, and do you, uh, this is a lot of questions, do the households uh, afford uh, the pumps? So maybe uh, you can talk a bit about uh, any interactions with local authorities. Yes, there's definitely a big push. Um, you know, I think like 23% of our GDP, you know, comes from agriculture, comes from the production of smallholder farmers. So government is very involved. Um, local authorities are very involved. Uh, but sometimes um, the involvement could be either, either in training or sometimes it's within actually the local authorities themselves buy, buying solar water pumps from us. So there's a little bit of, uh, there's a bit of interaction uh, between the local authority, but it's, it's more open um, you know, to different private companies. Sometimes we do get the bids. And then sometimes you actually do, um, you know, get opportunities to train farmers that, uh, that are organized by the local government. So we do, we do quite a bit of interaction with them. And there's a lot of initiatives that are actually driven by the government um, with regards to agriculture and smallholders. Um, so we do participate in those a lot. And can you give us kind of a clear uh, picture of what the impact of the intervention is on rural livelihoods? What, what have you seen on, on farmer incomes, for example? So we've been in this market for about, uh, like roughly right now, about two years. We have installed 150 systems. Um, just a few examples that I'll pull out is, um, so 60% so of our customers actually are horticulture farmers, and then about 25% are livestock farmers. Uh, for horticulture farmers, just to give just one example, um, there was a farmer that was supplying a local a restaurant uh, within, within Kampala. They're based in the outskirts of, of Kampala. So before we, uh, we, sold, we sold him a solar water pump, he was producing about 6,000 heads of letters uh, in a month, uh, but he was spending a lot um, in terms of maintenance and fuel on the generator pump that he was using. It was basically a diesel uh, generator pump that he was using. And once he switched, he was able to, to save that money uh, and he expanded his farm. Uh, right now, he's producing about 10,000 heads of lettuce uh, a month. So he has been able to expand, he has been able to save. And even when we talk about the labor uh, that he actually uses at the farm, it has it was reduced because you know solar water pumps are more or less automated um, if you compare them to fuel pumps. So that's one example that I'll give. Another example was uh, a poultry farmer that we found in the same scenario using a fuel pump. Um, spending about the same, about $1,000 uh, a month on maintenance, fuel, and repairs. He switched over. Um, so right now, he had about, when we, when we, when we found him, he had about 20,000 birds. Um, so right now, he has expanded to about uh, 30,000. So there's a lot, a lot of examples uh, that I could go through, but we definitely see the change. We definitely see the difference uh, in, in, in terms of productivity, in terms of incomes, in terms of uh, farm expansion, uh, if you will. Thanks, Vincent. That was really clear. It sounds like there's a clear business case for switching out um, gen sets there. That's that's great. 
Um, maybe I could um, hand back to McKenna so she can have a go at some of these questions. Thanks, Kevin. I'm really curious about this one about subsidies uh, because we, I think there's been an ongoing discussion in productive use and even in energy access really generally about the role of subsidies and, and asset financing. So we've got a question there here about, are there any examples of asset financing and, and subsidies to customers? And relatedly, there's also questions about, is that worthwhile? Is that a worthwhile thing to do to push productive use? Now I have my own thoughts, but I'm super interested in what the panel has to say. Uh, I don't know who wants to start. Um, perhaps Elizabeth, do you think there's, you know, it's worthwhile to push the subsidies and, and are there any examples of where this is worth? Well, um, I would say um, subsidies are good, but then uh, there has to be a clear model on how that is going to work. So for example, in our case, we are talking about buying the PUE um, assets and then deploying them in the community. But then we, we have to come up with the model of how that is going to work because we cannot just give the community, the access to the community for free. Obviously, it's not going to be sustainable. So there has to be a way of the community uh, paying back, even if it means um, maybe 50% of, the, of, of that grant uh, over a period of time. But then to give, it a, to, to give productive use of energy, like the, the larger productive use of energy, a push, there is need for that uh, type of subsidy. Yeah, perhaps another perspective, uh, I don't know, Lilna or Yodit, what, what do you think about the idea of subsidies, uh, how worthwhile they are and, and about um, where they have worked? Okay, maybe I can add some. Uh, well, I think from, from our side, uh, the subsidy part uh, is much more uh, profitable in a sense. Most of the communities that doesn't have a grid connection are, you know, uh, very far away, uh, either topographically or there are certain ways why we didn't have the grid connection for them. So it is best to subsidize it so that uh, you know the economic and social uh, activity in that area will be motivated once there is a subsidized uh, a mini grid or off grid solution. And once you uh, associate those uh, initiatives with productive use in. Uh, of the energy, then the community will be able to uh, generate new income and also uh, through time, they will also be able to uh, be motivated to invest in this uh, themselves. So subsidy in our opinion is a little bit more uh, acceptable so that you know through time uh, things will change. And maybe while I'm still here, I, I can answer one of the question where uh, a participant has asked about example uh, where the project is, is that okay? Absolutely, go for it, Okay, so uh, uh, earlier I said that we have commissioned some uh, studies about the, you know, the benefit of this productive use energy and uh, we've uh, uh, identified it in a context and uh, what kind of productive use interventions we need. So the context is that uh, we large rural villages, you know, where there is large and dense villages and uh, where the the grid connection is 20 kilometers away from that area. Uh, there is also another context that we've used where there is a small rural village where they are small, sparsely populated village and uh, the uh, grid is five kilometers away. So with those two uh, contexts, we have this uh, 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 projects. One, it's in, uh, in the town of Kinti. It is a large rural village. Uh, around Lake Tana, east of Lake Tana. So uh, the nearest distribution line is 20 kilometer away and the residents is around 15,000 residents in the surrounding area. So usually wh what this productive uh, use energy that we have commissioned is uh, for meals, uh, for grain meals. Uh, so uh, there is around um, three grain meals in that area. They have been using wow. diesel uh, to provide the meal service. So it cost us around, you know, $1 per liter because they had to travel uh, to the nearest town to also uh, uh, 
buy the diesel. So that was a little bit costly for the community. So once well, the solution we used is the hybrid mini grid system where we in, in, installed the 160 kilowatts of solar along with 160 kilowatts of diesel generator and uh, 240 kilowatt per hour lead acid battery. So with this hybrid mini grid system, we were able to uh, power the existing mills and also to add two more mills in that area, uh, which actually saved uh, money for the uh, for the millers for the milling. Well, so the cost has just reduced to 16 cents kilowatt per hour. So this is one of the projects we have, and then the second one is for the. Uh, small sparsely populated rural village. It is in the town of Auramba uh, in South Gondor. So this is also the same. Uh, their income is mainly from maize, teff, sorghum, chickpea, and also cattle. So uh, they uh, have, they usually have only three meals that serve the surrounding area. So they also irrigate uh, the, their agriculture through traditional methods. So what we used in this project is we also, we used a standalone renewable mining system. Uh, we installed a six kilowatt of solar uh, with a 16 kilowatt hour of lead acid battery, uh, which uh, helped them to have this milling. So these are the two uh, very effective examples that I can say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edith, for those um, wonderful examples. And I'm sure people can follow up um, on the ministry website to find out more information. Um, so I just want to um, go back to Lilna a little bit here uh, and talk a, a little bit more about women. So how can women use be encouraged, especially in male dominated households? You told us about how the decision maker influences the type of productive use and in, it's typically men. So how do we encourage sort of um, more women to take up productive uses um, in, in the households? Thank you, Matana. So here we need to actually implement different kind of training uh, programs that will actually change the mindset of the society in overall. Because if we say the decision maker is the husband uh, or a male in the household, then it will be up to um, that person to make a decision on prioritization. So until we get to a financial empowerment where we will need to also have programs for example calling on community meetings when we are implementing uh, energy programs mini grids or standalone systems so that to educate the community on the use of these appliances and how it will actually change the lives of the entire households so it's a it's, it's about education and not so much about focusing uh, as suggested here on typical household uses of energy, but it's about like a wider education piece about how it's beneficial to the entire household, regardless of, I guess, which gender uses the, their plants and, and sort of enabling women to take to take up these productive uses. Exactly, because uh, providing finance is just for, for example, if we provide finance for cook stoves or refrigerators, then the woman may not have the capacity to take on a loan. Yeah. By, it, by it herself, she may not have the decision making power or also right. a capacity, financial capacity. But if we educate mm -hmm. the entire society, then it will be actually because people before making a decisions, if we go into a household and say it will benefit one person in your household, then they may say, OK, a television actually would entertain the entire family. Mm -hmm. so we mm -hmm. need to tell them that eventually when you buy a cook stove this person uh, your wife or your uh, girl child could actually save time to go to school which would eventually change the life the lives of all the households she could buy you a dsc tv in the yeah. tv so we need to have work more on education when we're implementing energy programs thanks that's, that's such a great um, and powerful kind of tool um to kind of um, start this journey of transforming not only a family, but I think a community. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Kevin um, for the last couple of questions here um, as, as we get towards the end. Thanks, McKenna. Um, we have a very interesting question at the top here around tariffs and 
this issue around daytime versus nighttime energy and, and the costs of producing that energy um, and different tariffs that can be designed and, and can get into a very technical discussion. Um, but um, I'm wondering if Elizabeth, you could talk a bit about how uh, United Purpose looked at tariffs. Uh, are they are there different levels of tariffs on your mini grids to households versus productive users? Um, for example, which one is more expensive? Is there a daytime, nighttime tariff, uh, and so forth? Thank you so much, Kirby. Um, yes, we have uh, different tariff categories for our customers. Uh, so we have other customers who are only like a service; but they only pay a service fee for the month. So they have a limited uh, amount of electricity that they get uh, per day. Once it is finished, they get cut off and then it resets the next day. That one, that provision was made for uh, poor households who, can, uh, who cannot afford the pay-as-you-go um, tariff. So other than that, we have the pay-as-you-go tariff, which has also been, um, is different depending on the time of use with uh, the daytime use being lower than the night, uh, the nighttime use. And also it gets cheaper, the more, the more a customer uses through the month, the more it gets cheaper. So we also have a tariff for institutions. So yeah, we have different tariff uh, segments. The reason why the daytime tariff is uh, cheaper than the rates is because we have excess power being uh, generated during the day, during the daylight hours and yet um, uh, the load uh, during the day is uh, lower than the, the night time. So we are trying to encourage people to use more electricity during the day. That's why we have um, uh, lowered the, day, the daytime tariff. So once we get more productive users doing their um, uh, production or businesses during the, the day, it means they will, they will be able to to utilize that uh, spare capacity and increase um, uh, income. So if we have that type of increase in income, we should be able to subsidize even the other tariffs, including the nighttime uh, tariff. And just a quick follow-up in terms of the daytime, nighttime, have you actually seen a shift in demand more towards the daytime because of the lower tariffs? Not really, because we have uh, we don't have a lot of productive use of energy customers. So the the businesses that are, that are there, they're just um, small scale village businesses. Like someone is co selling cold drinks, they're powering up a fridge, uh, a barber shop, a video show. So uh, because the number of businesses, we, the, the the larger number of customers are households. So for the households, they are busy during the day doing other income generating activities. But then at night when everyone is back home, that's when they, they actually switch on their appliances. They have their lights on. But for the businesses, we haven't really seen a, a large increase in the number of, um, of people using the electricity during the day because of, the, because of lowering the tariff. Thanks, Elizabeth. Interesting. Um, just looking at the time, I just want to ask one last question, um, talking about demand stimulation from cooperatives, so using existing structures to build up demand more quickly. Um, I'm wondering if, if I, I just want to place it out there and see if anyone wants to take this on. It's related to Vincent's um, solution in terms of targeting um, cooperatives for aggregate demand for solar water pumps. So it seems to be working there. But I'm a bit curious, is, is this an option in, in, in contexts in Ethiopia and Malawi, for example, using um, a cooperative model to maybe be an anchor client, for example? Could, could that be successful? Or have you seen um, success with that? We, we have not tried um, the cooperative model yet. But it's something that we were trying to look into uh, moving forward to our next um, mini grid site. So it's a it's a community where there is a lot of um, soy being grown as well as groundnuts. So there are already cooperatives around uh, that type of agricultural production. So I can I cannot say we've already had an experience working with that model, but it's something that we are trying to explore. 
Thanks, Elizabeth. It sounds like there might be some potential there to uh, for United Purpose. That's that's great. Um, we have two minutes left, and I have to hand back to McKenna to give us her final thoughts. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. I think this has been a really excellent conversation. We've had from all sort of stratifications of kind of uh, people and stakeholders engaged in productive use. We've seen the example of Ethiopia and how they're integrating productive use into the national electrification plans and those great examples from you did uh, about the work that, that is being done on the ground. And then we've seen these challenges that smaller mini grids um, can really encounter. The examples from Malawi from United Purpose have been so powerful to show what is the potential, but also um, kind of some of these challenges that we are yet to meet and the fact that more investment is needed, more technical support is needed, um, especially for productive use um, and exploring those questions around some of the levers we can pull, like tariffs, like subsidies, has also been really interesting to discuss. And then we talked about solar water pumps as one example of a productive use in Uganda um, and how Vincent and team are really uh, working hard to, to give bespoke solutions to smallholders coupled with um, this market linkages and all the other ecosystem um, solutions that really help to push a productive use. Uh, and then, of course, the challenge of integrating gender um, and, and, you know, Lilna's uh, remarks were so exciting to, to see how it's really possible if we think more holistically to integrate gender. And so our, pan our panelists have been great at showing us the challenges, the lessons, um, and, and all this productive use of energy debate has been so exciting and we want to thank them so much. Um, There's so many barriers to be tackled yet on productive use, um, especially if we want to scale and we want to achieve SDG 7 um, to get that universal energy for access class, IED, and all the folks you see on the call today will continue working, partnering with each other to kind of spar and promote the benefits and impacts of productive use. And hopefully SDG 7 will just be around the corner for all of us. So with that, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us um, online and also for our panelists. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, we're, uh, that's it. <laughs> we, we can close out. Thank you.